Welcome to Inside Admission, the podcast that gives you a behind the scenes look at the college admission process with the experts in and around college admission. Welcome to the Inside Admission podcast. I'm your host, Andy Palumbo. And today we have a very special guest, the New York Times Your Money columnist, Ron Lieber. Thanks for joining us, Ron. Hey, thanks for having me. So, uh, Ron, why don't you uh, start off by uh, introducing yourself to our listeners, telling us uh, a little bit about uh, your career and, and what you've been up to lately. Sure. Uh, my name is Ron Lieber. I am the Your Money columnist for the New York Times. I've been in that role since 2000 and. Eight. It's been long enough now that I have to reach for the year. I'm pretty sure I got that right because that was when the world started to circle the drain economically and I was kind of in the middle of it. Um, what am I working on right now? Um, my book, The Price You Pay for College, came out earlier this year. It'll be out in paperback next summer. Um, and, uh, you know, at the times I write about anything and everything under the sun that hits you uh, in the wallet um, with an emphasis on things that tend to evoke a lot of emotions because when we make emotional um, decisions in our personal financial lives, it often leads to trouble and college may be, and paying for college for our kids or ourselves may be the most um, emotional decision of them all. Um, so, you know, I try to write about it as much as I can in the times and extracurricularly, I do it a lot more. Great. Great. Thanks, Ron. So, uh, one of the things I like to do with this podcast, um, you know, we've got students, parents, uh, and school counselors who are sort of our primary audience. Um, I, you know, I like I like this to get a little personal. I think one of the the things that's happened uh, during COVID that's been a positive is, you know, just this, you know, being able to, you know, zoom someone and and you know connect and and learn a bit about them, but also to to break down some of the barriers. You know, like we're you know, we're in our, our living spaces or offices and, uh, you know, streaming live. And we may have my great Dane Moose pop in at some point. I don't know. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, so really trying to break down the myth of these, you know, admissions figures in a dark room deciding students' fate and just showing the human side. Um, so, uh, you know, tell us a little bit about uh, your college search and what was that like? You know, like, how did you start it? What was important? And uh, ultimately, where did you uh, where did you go? Yeah, so um, the fit side of this was pretty simple, and the money side of it um, was ultimately simple too. Um, but the way I got to the answer was uh, extremely unconventional. Um, so I grew up in Chicago, um, oldest of three kids, went to the Francis W. Parker School, a pro progressive private school there. Um, and my family was doing um, very well financially, and then everything changed. Um, my parents split up. They spent five years, um, you know, sort of settling themselves divorce-wise divorce with the question of who was going to pay for college and how much being the sort of central issue. Um, and that was expensive enough. But then my dad lost his job and didn't earn a lot of income to speak of for a couple of years. And it was about a dozen years until our family was anywhere close to being back where it had been financially. So um, it, it, there were not a lot of kids on financial aid at Francis Parker at the time. The, the board met in committee to decide whether the Lieber kids were going to be evicted for lack of ability to pay, and they rustled up the money somehow. It is still the nicest thing that anyone has ever done for me. So when it came time to apply for college, um, I knew where I wanted to go. Um, I had all of this certainty about the fact that I was going to spend the rest of my life in Chicago, uh, which did not happen. Um, and, uh, and so I figured the best thing I could do for myself was to go to the very best college outside of the Midwest that I possibly could that was not very big because I felt like I really benefited from being at a small school in small classes with just, you know, world-class educators. And so I went out and found the very best school in America that sort of fit that bill. And I thought it was Amherst College. And so I was ready to apply early decision. But we didn't have enough money uh, for me to go. And our college counselor at the time, John McClintock, who was a great guy, um, just didn't know all that much about the need-based financial aid system. Because in 1988 at private schools, you know, there just weren't a lot of people who um, needed help in that way. And so he knew the guy to see in the Chicagoland area if you needed help. And he gave us his phone number for this guy up in Evanston. 
um, and said, call him. He can help you out. So we call the guy, right? And he says, oh, sure, sure, sure. Come to this address on Hinman Street next Tuesday at 5 p.m. and bring me $50 in cash. So we were like, okay, that's his fee. You know, he's not reporting it to the IRS, whatever, right? So, you know, we get in our rattle trap Chevy, Chevy citation and drive on up Sheridan Road. And we get to this address on Hinman. And it's the Office of Financial Aid at Northwestern University. And we're thinking to ourselves, what the heck? And so we go in the side door, side door, as instructed. I, I went back a year ago just to check that I, my memory wasn't failing me. There really is a side door on that building. We go in the side door, and it turns out Roger, he's the assistant director of financial aid at Northwestern. And he's got this side hustle going where every day at five o'clock in the fall, all of these, you know, sort of needy teenagers show up with their parent or parents. And he proceeds to explain all of the secrets of the financial aid system. Right. And this guy knew exactly what he was talking about. And I got into Amherst early decision. Now it's a rich school. Right. But, you know, with Roger's help, um, not only did, uh, you know, I get enough to get through without um, a lot of student loans and without completely crushing my family. But he also told us that it was okay to go back to Amherst every year and ask for a little more if we felt like, you know, we had need that was not being met. And thankfully, each year, Joe Paul Case, who was sort of a legend in financial aid circles at Amherst, um, St. Joe, we call him. He was actually an ordained minister. Uh, that's his side hustle. Um, St. Joe would sit down with us every year and, you know, would manage to come up with a little bit more money. So, I, you know, that's a lot long story, right? But is it any wonder that I grew up to write about personal finance? Uh, I, I don't think so. I think there's a direct connection between all that and what I ended up doing in general and, and specifically with, with the price you pay for college. So that's funny. I didn't expect to hear a side door story from you, Ron, but uh, yeah. Um, so, I, I, we didn't uh, do any. We didn't do anything <laughs> wrong. I, you know, I think if the 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 folks at, at Northwestern had known what he was up to, they probably would have been a little annoyed. But I don't think he would have done it if we were if I was applying to Northwestern. I, I think he drew yeah, the line there. Yeah. So, yeah. Um. So you know, you know, talking about your book, you know, that's it's a huge commitment writing a book and a labor of love. Um. You know, what made you decide to write the the price you pay for college? How the idea come out, come about, and tell us a bit about the journey as you you researched and and wrote the book. Yeah, I mean, almost anything I've ever done in my career that is all worthwhile has come from hearing about somebody else's problem or challenge. Um, so this was not an idea that. Um, you know, kind of emerged out of my brain fully formed. I wrote a book in 2015 called The Opposite of Spoiled, which was all about how and when and why to talk to your kids about money, what to say when you do, and, and what those conversations had to do with um, values and, and not just, you know, pennies and nickels and, and dollar bills. And I had to figure out when I was writing that book where it was going to stop, right? At what age, you know, this is going to be about parenting kids, kids ages, you know, five to what? And it became clear very quickly that the college conversation was so fraught and so profound that there was just no way I was going to be able to cover it in a chapter. But the stuff kept running into it. So I was just tossing it into this giant Google Doc pile. And I, I thought that there might be a book in it somehow, but I, I had no idea what it was. So anyway, The Opposite of Spoiled comes out. And, you know, within a year or two, I start hearing from readers. Um, maybe they've read, you know, some of what I was writing about student loans in the New York Times. I, I don't know what it was, but they sensed in me that I knew something that they um, didn't. Um, which I did not very much, right? But they kept coming to me with questions like this. They were like, Ron, you know, your newspaper can't shut up about the fact that we live in a world of big data and big data governs everything. And so they said, riddle me this, right? Um, you know, my kid in Oak Park, Illinois, is into the University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana. And, you know, that's going to cost us, uh, you know, $125,000 all in because the state is a fiscal basket case. And, um, you know, going to the flagship now costs uh, more than more than you might imagine. But, but we can afford that, right? And then my kid got into McAllister College, nice small liberal arts college, um, you know, got $25,000 a year in this merit aid thing, which we don't even know what that is, right? But anyway, McAllister would cost $200,000 a year. And then the kid shot the lights out, right? Applied to Vanderbilt. It was a reach school, 
got in, but no need-based aid because we make $262,000 a year. Cry us a river, right? But we can't go around writing checks for $300,000. And so can you please point me to the big data that explains why Vanderbilt is $100,000 better than McAllister and McAllister is $75,000 better than Champaign-Urbana? And I thought, wow, uh, no, uh, I can't point you to that data set. I'm not sure it exists. And I'm pretty sure that the reason that it doesn't exist is because the schools like it that way, right? Because in the absence of hard-headed data, people make soft-hearted decisions based on fear and guilt and snobbery and other unhelpful emotions. So as I thought about that some more, and it like took me a year or two to get it through my thick skull, I was like, you idiot, you've been spending all this time spilling ink in the newspaper about how to save for college or how to pay for college with or without student loans. But those are simple questions. And what these readers are asking, they're asking what to pay for college. They're asking about value. They're asking about values, right? And as yep. soon as that kind of crystallized in my head, thanks to them, right? Not to my own brain power, but thanks to sort of repeated pummeling from unsatisfied customers, I was like, oh my God, I can't answer that in one column or 10 or, or 50. That's the book. That's what that Google Doc was about. So it took me a while, but that's how I got there. That's great. That's great. Mm -hmm. So it's funny. One of the, the most recent uh, podcasts I recorded with uh, Marie Bigham, she actually mentioned your book uh, as we were talking. Um, and you know, she argued that it should be the primary guide for uh, college search in 2021. And, and that's, that's hard pra high praise, but, uh, but I, I tend to agree. Um, I mean, I, I, I think, you know, I'll share with the listeners what I've told you before is that, uh, you know, I was, I was reading your book earlier this year and I'm reading about the college savings plans and I, I put it down mid chapter and I started researching, you know, 529s and I, I set them up for my kids because I was like, it's that thing in the back of your head that you just keep putting off, putting off and, and you, you scared me enough. Um, so, um, you know, it's just, there's so much in there, whether, whether you're someone who is just trying to wrap your head around, uh, the basics, uh, or you're someone like me who, who lives it and works it every day. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I'm curious what, what were the key goals? And you sort of talked about this in your last answer, but like, what were your, your, your key goals you're setting out to achieve? And, and what were the two or three things you hope that, that readers would take away from the book? Yeah. So, um, first of all, um, I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you for getting it done, <laughs> for opening those 529 plans. Um, I'm, I'm proud of you for admitting um, that you hadn't gotten it done yet, even though you're, you know, effectively a trained assassin in this world. Um, a lot of us have shoemaker's kids problems. You should yeah, see right, the, right. You know, the pile of bills I have at home that I haven't gotten to yet. <laughs> so first of all, good on you. Second of all, thank you. Um, Marie is about the toughest customer uh, there is uh, in this world. Um, and, uh, you know, that's about the highest compliment that anyone could pay. Um, and the fact that she said it about something that was just sort of adjacent to the book, you know, it, you know, because my book is really more about money. Um, but here's the thing, right? Here's what I was trying to get at that I, I, I think Marie found useful, which is that um, in order to discern value um, in an environment like this, in an industry like this one, uh, you need to ask yourself some tough questions at the very beginning about what it is exactly that you're trying to accomplish, right? What's the point of the exercise? What is the definition of success and how much is enough, right? And once you establish that for yourself, what could get in the way of clear-headed decision-making? So what is college, right? What is the point? Um, and I, I, you know, ran laps around the country asking, you know, parents and families about this. And I heard versions of the same three things over and over again, which is one thing that I really hope that, that people get straight and, and that I think was, you know, the biggest part of what Marie found interesting, right? You go to college for three reasons, according to the people I talked to. You go um, for the learning, right? Um, yeah. To have your head unscrewed, right, and your brain taken out and rearranged by expert practitioners into a better and bigger version of itself in four years or so. Um, you go to college for the kinship, 
right? As one person put it to me, uh, at college, I met the kind of people I never could have imagined existing in the world, right? I want to put that on a bumper sticker, right? Because that, <laughs> that is what we are seeking for, um, uh, you know, for our kids and, and not just for their peer group, right? But also for the mentors, right? I'm, I'm sure everybody right. listening is, you know, familiar with the Gallup research that says that one big part of, you know, life satisfaction when you're in your 20s is having had a mentor during your college years, right? And so that can be a professor, right? Um, but if you're hoping for that, you, you better be in a small enough place or be an extroverted enough um, individual to, you know, to, to forge that relationship. It could be an administrator, right? It could be your financial aid officer. I'm still in touch with St. Joe Paul case, by the way. Um, you know, it could be a member of the clergy. It could be a lot of people, right? Um, so that's kinship. And then you go to school for the credential. And maybe the credential, you know, gets you into nursing or, or teaching or medical school. And maybe um, the credential comes from a place that is so exalted, that is so well thought of in uh, graduate school admissions committees or on Wall Street or, or at Google or whatever, um, that it gets you into rooms that you and your family and whatever privilege it had accumulated over generations could never have vaulted you into in the first place, right? So learning, kinship, um, credential. And I make mm -hmm. no judgments about families that um, care only about one of those things. Um, and you can divide that pie chart uh, however you want. But if you're a family and you're not thinking about those things and shopping for them specifically, then you're almost certainly doing it wrong. And then there's the three emotions, right, that can get in the way. Um, there's fear, right? Fear of falling down the social class ladder if you don't make the right decision or spend enough money. Um, guilt that you haven't saved enough, that you're not willing to spend enough, um, you know, that you haven't done enough to, you know, kind of cultivate your kid to be a, 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 a good applicant for these places. Um, and then there's snobbery, right? Maybe you're not a snob, right? You really don't care about the bumper sticker in your windshield <laughs> or the Instagram reveal come April. You're worried about other people's snobbery, right? Your kid really wants to go work on Wall Street. And, you know, the people who hire at the A-list firms, they're a bunch of snobs. And they may, you know, look askance or completely discard resumes from all but seven and a half institutions on the face of the planet, right? Um so you just have to know yourself. And I want people to be rigorously emotionally honest with themselves, uh, you know, as they navigate this process, because I, I don't think we interrogate our feelings enough in general when it comes to money and quite specifically in this area. That's a, that's a great perspective. And it's definitely something that I took away from it. I mean, I think uh, so few people, I mean, I think m many uh, who are doing a decent job look at features um, but taking a step beyond the features of the institutions and thinking about what, what it is that you value about those features or what it is that you value about the culmination of those things uh, that make a place unique is, is, is so critical. And, you know, hopefully as, as students and, and those helping them through the process go through it, that becomes a clearer picture. But, but to your point, if you can get that at the beginning, you're, you're that much uh, further ahead of the game than, than most of your peers. Mm -hmm. So, so as you're thinking about what you value, you know, a, a part of this sort of, uh, you know, uh, shopping pattern is the, the traditional college visit. And that's been a bit disrupted because of COVID, but, but let's just, let's go, let's go back to, to the before times and, you know, what is the college visit? How do families do it? And, and, you know, what do you think could or should be done differently about that? Yeah. So my own kid is about to enter uh, the sales funnel. And, um, <laughs> you know, it's it's interesting uh, to see about, you know, how, how all my highfalutin ideas are, you know, crashing headlong into uh, <laughs> what my wife thinks um, and, and, and what my daughter wants to do. I, I think my daughter and I are more simpatico than my wife and I are uh, on some of this. I'm trying to bring her along. Um, but, uh, you know, my general sense about this is that people don't shop early enough and they don't shop hard enough. Um, and, the, you know, the early thing is controversial. I, you know, my daughter's college counselor at, at school is, you know, not a, um, not a big fan of, you know, starting in um, sophomore year. I, you know, we're going to take our first trip in the second half of sophomore year because 
I, I just think to kind of cram this all in, you know, to, to junior year or to do it in the summers when nobody's around, um, mm -hmm. just doesn't give you a good enough sense of this place. And, you know, a lot of people will, you know, show up in Massachusetts or show up in Ohio or show up in Minnesota and they'll, you know, the group info session, tour, eat lunch, get in the car, two hours, but like race to the next group info session, another tour, two in each day, go to 10 during one week, and then like we're all done. And I don't think you get a good enough sense of these places or, or to know what you want um, if you don't sleep over, right, with a friend in, in you know, better non-pandemic times, or if you don't go to a class. And so, you know, the problem with this, the problem with, like, a, a lot of this shopping harder is that the only way you can do it is if you have um, the time to do a ton of research and the time to get on the road and the money to stay in the hotels and, you know, all the rest of it, right? So I hate to give people a blueprint that, you know, doesn't work as well for people who don't have, you know, the level of like affluence or, or, or privilege that I do or that most New York Times readers do. Um, but it just is what it is. You know, this thing could cost $350,000 and you should not make a decision based on the three hours you spent at one out of 10 places in the space of five days, right? So maybe you can go back and, and spend more time at, you know, some of the places that you've gotten into at the end, and that's all fine. But I just want people to like, show up for longer and ask better questions when they're there. Great. Thanks for that. So for, for about a decade now, uh, you've solicited and published college application essays. And I'm curious, what, what was the genesis of this tradition? And, and you know, now that you've read more college essays than maybe anyone who isn't a school counselor or a college admissions officer, um, you know, what do you think is important for students and their parents to know about the college essay? Sure. Um, so this got started in 2010, 2011, right? So like, what's a, what's a money columnist doing waiting around in college essays? So I, 2010, 2011, 2012, I'm, I'm talking with an old friend, um, Rebecca Starr. Uh, she was a, um, a, an admissions officer at Brown University for a couple of years. She's I'm mostly out of the game now. Um, but she got to tell me like, you know, sort of year two or three of that recession, she said, you know, it's just like an offhanded remark. He said, you know, we're seeing a lot more essays now about money, lack of money, about work, about social class, about, you know, sort of economic justice or injustice. And, you know, she just, um, kind of moved on from there, but I got to thinking like, wow, I'd like to read some of those essays. Um, and then I sat with that thought for a moment and I was like, wait a second, I could read some of those essays. I could just like put out an open casting call, ask people to send them in and then like, you know, pick four or five that are really thought provoking and put them in the newspaper. And, you know, because more often than not at the New York Times, they tend to indulge my, my wacky ideas. Um, and, and they believe as I do that like the definition of personal finance and personal finance coverage should be, you know, kind of stretched to the lunatic fringe. They, they let me do it. Um, and the stuff that came in was so good. And each year it feels like it's gotten better and better and better. So I've been doing it for eight or nine years now, and I just absolutely love it. And I, you know, literally every year as I'm reading through them, I, you know, I burst into tears repeatedly, um, because I'm just rooting so hard for these kids, you know? Um, and so I, what can I say about that? I, I don't know. Cause you know, I'm reading for something different than you might be. Um, but here's what I can say. I mean, I can say two things, right? Um, I'm pretty sure a, a big reason I got into college was that my essays were good. And my essays were good because I read Harry Bald's book on writing the college application essay. And I should always have it within reach, um, <laughs> but I don't see it. It came out in a new edition a couple of um a couple of years ago, I, I think most people in the admissions game know it. Um, and, you know, he 
told the story, painted a picture of admissions officers, you know, reading the, you know, 57th file at 1237 a.m., you know, on the fourth to last night of, you know, the period where they read through all the applications. And he was like, how are you going to shake this person loose? Because at this point, you know, they, they probably hate their job. Um, they probably hate teenagers. <laughs> um, and like, what are you, you going to do about it? Um, and, you know, I, I wrote an essay about a television commercial for waste management. I mean, I know nobody else did that in my year at Amherst. Um, and so, you know, the, the same thing I, I, I think is true, you know, for essays now. I, I mean, you have to tell a story, right? Um, yep. And, you know, there's this quote that... Um, is attributed to Jerry Garcia that wasn't actually from him. I, I I don't know where it came from or who made it up. But, you know, the big idea, at least as far as the Grateful Dead was concerned, is like they're not better than any other band. Um, they're not bigger than any other band, but they're making the music that only they can make. Right. So what is the music that only you can make? Right. What is going to make your essay utterly and completely different? Right. How are you going to get close to that standard? I like that. That's great. So you, you and I have been been following uh, an exchange or two on on Twitter the past twenty four hours on standardized testing, one of my favorite topics, um, and, and I, I think standardized testing itself, uh, you know, one of the biggest changes uh, to happen to college admissions during COVID is is what's happened with standardized testing, with a, a bunch of schools sort of doing emergency test option policies with with an uncertain end in sight, um, and so. The reality right now, um, you know, we don't know what it'll look like two, three, four years from now, but the reality is the vast majority of schools are now test optional. Um, and so fewer, in my opinion, very few are likely to go back to requiring test scores. It's going to be a very difficult play for all but a few schools um, that may have that desire and that uh, sort of power within that competitive market. How do you feel this has changed the landscape when it comes to testing? And, and what do you think uh, students and parents should know about that? Yeah, so I don't think we know enough yet because just to like, you know, sort of pound the table, um, you know, for transparency, as I did a lot in the book and do in general, I, I don't think we know enough yet about how, you know, whether people submitted a test or not, you know, effect, affected their admissions odds, which is not my, um, you know, area of expertise. And, you know, when it comes to money, um, I really wish that more schools would say in bold underlined ITAL on their website um, uh, that whether or not you submit a test will have nothing, zero, to do with whether or not you get merit aid. Um, our algorithms, uh, which we are going to confess here that we all use, even though no parents and families understand that it's a computer making the initial merit aid offer in many instances, right? Our algorithms, our algorithms, our algorithmic formulas have been wiped clean of the test score input. We um, are test blind when it comes to merit aid. And if you're not, then admit that too, right? I, I get that this is hard for schools that don't have big staffs and just got used to like using a grid system where you had GPA over mm -hmm. here and test score over here. And like, if you were interested in, you know, Lake Forest College or Wabash or the University of Alabama's, you know, merit aid system, you just like look to where you cross and that's what you get, right? If you got in. And so, you know, imagine all of the poor kids who were, I, I don't mean that um, money wise, but just, you know, imagine all of the kids during the first COVID year who really wanted that merit aid from Alabama, um, but couldn't get a seat at a testing center, right? And it took Alabama until what, you know, April 29th to finally say, oh, you don't really need to take a test. Uh, that's not nice. Yeah. So you're, you're speaking my language here, Ron. So I actually, in 2019 at the National uh, Admissions Conference, uh, I presented on just this topic on encouraging test optional schools to eliminate the consideration of uh, standardized test scores in any type of merit or need-based aid calculation. Because uh, the 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 truth is is that even though before the pandemic we had over a thousand schools were test optional for admissions, it appeared to me when I tried to find co-panelists for that very topic. I struggled to find 
other colleagues um, across the country who were were blind uh, in in merit aid and, and financial aid. And I think that, you know, it was 2019 then, 2021 now. I mean, it, these days, affordability is as important, if not more important than admissibility. Uh, and so the fact that this is often a hidden metric, it, I think is, is problematic. Um, and I, I do think that at least initially, I think a lot of this is because people have been so focused on trying to get the test optional status for admissions is that they jump right into operationalization of it and don't take the next step from a student perspective to think about where that could impact. But I do think there's also another piece to this, is, and that is that, you know, in order to walk away from standardized test scores, um, like WPI has, we are fully test blind, um, uh, like the UC system, you, you need to walk away from them completely and you give up some level of certainty or predictability. And, and so that's a difficult thing to do when you're sitting in my chair. Um, but I think it's imperative that schools are either doing that or, or being transparent about how they're using that merit because, uh, you know, I, I penned an op-ed encouraging uh, my peers to, to go blind, um, at least for uh, merit aid uh, back in, you know, October 2019. And it largely fell on deaf ears but then the number one question I was asked during COVID as all these schools went test optional was, will it impact merit aid? Um, and so I think that that is the, the burning question. It was that last year, it was this year as well. And I think it's going to continue to be until that there's, there's more transparency there. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. I mean, I could not agree more. Enjoying the podcast, like, and subscribe to this YouTube video. You can also find us on the web at InsideAdmissionPodcast.com, and you can find and engage with us on social media, where our handle is Inside Admission, on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Now, back to the pod. We've been um, you know, talking about uh, financial aid here, but um, you know, can you go into, you know, for those who, who might sort of be listening and say, hey, we, I'm just getting started here, you know, give me a crash course, from your perspective, how, how would you best describe uh, the difference between merit-based aid and need-based aid to someone who's, who's new to this process? Oh, gosh. I mean, I, I mean, this isn't completely true, right? But if you're trying to boil it down just so you can kind of start getting your head around it, if, if you're coming to this fresh, you know, need-based aid is about um, what you have and merit-based aid is about what you do. Um, Need-based aid is dependent mostly, although not largely, on income. Um, Merit-based aid, uh, you tend to get more of it if you are, uh, you know, in the top, uh, you know, 25% of, of a school's, um, uh, you know, admit pool, um, although that can change depending on the year and what the school needs and, and all of that. Um, Need-based aid is doled out by the Office of Financial Aid. Uh, merit aid um, is dealt with by the admissions office. Now, there can be overlap, and, you know, there's usually some, um, you know, muckety-muck upstairs who oversees uh, both of the departments. Um, uh, but, um, you know, that's sort of in, in general how it works. Um, you can appeal, you know, both awards. Uh, this is not negotiation. Um, all sorts of schools say we don't negotiate on their website. But um, but if you're asking politely, hey, you know, this number doesn't make any sense to me because I thought my kid, you know, sort of fell in the top 10 percent of your applicant pool or, hey, wait a minute, I just had these, you know, this giant collection of health expenses or you know, we earn $210,000 and you really think we can pay, you know, $58,000 per year? Um, can we just talk about how you came up with those numbers and what we think we can do? That's a conversation that nearly every school will have. Um, and so, uh, you know, you shouldn't um, treat college administrators by, like used car salespeople. And the other thing I think people don't understand um, is that uh, if you have a six-figure income, there's a pretty good chance that you earn more than the financial aid administrator or the admissions officer that you're appealing to, <laughs> unless you're, you know, speaking to a VP or director. And I mean, they are sympathetic, um, but they may not be empathetic because they may have much less money than you do. So just like watch your mouth. <laughs>
you know, like be polite. <laughs> it's okay to ask for things, but um, don't be entitled. Great, great, great advice. Let me tell you, that is uh, very good advice. Um, so uh, as we talk about financial aid, you know, I, I think something that's come out uh, a lot over the past five or six years that, that we hadn't really heard before is this idea that, um, you know, I, I'm going to take on no student debt or, or I don't want my, my son or daughter taking on any debt whatsoever. Um, and that's a, a, an interesting approach considering how uh, you know, the, the American higher education system works. I mean, it's, it's largely financed by debt. Um, you know, there, there is, there is rarely a quote unquote affordable option for almost any family, even as we look at rising costs in community colleges and in public universities. Um, so how do you think about, uh, student debt and, and how do you think students and parents, um, should, should consider debt within this process? Sure. Um, look, I, I, I'm all for um, taking a hard line. Um, uh, that's fine, but you should have your eyes absolutely wide open um, on that. Uh, because for most families, if you are unwilling to take on any debt, either as a parent or as um, or allowing your your undergraduate to take on debt, um, which in theory they can do at the age of 18, you know, without your permission, um, then you are almost certainly going to be limiting um, your choices, right? So I don't want anybody to walk away yeah. thinking, you know, it's sort of state school or bust in that circumstance, because there are all sorts of really good private colleges and universities that discount us something close to or maybe even less than um, what the net price would be at a state university. Um, but, you know, you're really limiting your choices. And the fact of the matter is, is that if the student borrows up to the federal limit of, you know, $31,000 or whatever it is for four years, that's not going to break them. You know, 330 and 50 bucks a month is not going to break anyone. And once you get into the income driven repayment programs that exist for federal loans, you know, if you fall on hard times or take a really low paying job, your monthly payment will be adjusted to something that is reasonable and that you can afford. So it's pretty hard to get into trouble uh, with $31,000 of undergraduate loans as long as you're paying attention um, when you graduate and, and managing them effectively. Um, Great. Hang on one second. Let me turn my yeah. light on here because it's not on. Yep. So uh, a final, well, uh, one more question on, on this uh, sort of admissions process, and then I have sort of two high level questions for you. So, uh, you know, many students uh, find themselves coming down to the wire, you know, not having made that final decision as they approach the traditional May 1 deadline. Uh, you know, we see it in colleges. We see, you know, sometimes you see 20, 30 percent of your class coming in in the last 48 hours. And so some of that is students just waiting until the last minute. A lot of it, um, I presume, is, is students making that difficult decision, uh, potentially based on values, potentially based on emotion, probably some combination of the two. Um, what advice do you have for students and, and parents who are, are guiding them through this process who are struggling to make that final decision between two or three top schools in that final week? Sure. I mean, I would say go back to your first principles, right? Look at your look at your pie chart, right? How big is the learning piece? How big is the kinship piece? Um, and how big is the credential piece? Um, and hopefully based on the size of those pieces or whether one or, or two are missing entirely, that helps bring some clarity, right? And, and you can write it down, you, you make a spreadsheet, you, you grade each of the schools on learning, kinship, and, um, and credential. And hopefully, you know, you've asked a dozen questions about each of those to everybody that you've met who's associated or affiliated with that institution. Um, and hopefully that's clarifying. I, you know, I think the other thing that I would say is that, you know, if it's a close call, um, chances are, you're going to do fine um, almost anywhere, right? Anywhere that you pick. Um, uh, that if you take college, you know, by the reins, by the horns, um, you know, there, there are incredible mentors. There are great friends. Um, 
there's a lot of learning to be done and and you can do amazing things with the credential and so you know, I would say don't sweat it much. And, you know, if there's a difference in price of, you know, $14,000 a year and, and you're a parent who's in the mix, um, it, you know, it's not unreasonable to say to the kid, like, think about, you know, think about uh, what it would mean to graduate debt free as opposed to not debt free or if you've been lucky and and have been able to save a lot, you could even say, hey, look, you know, if you choose the lower price school, we're going to leave this $40,000. We're going to leave $40,000 in the 529. And you can have that for graduate school. If you don't go to graduate school, uh, you can have that for your kids someday. And by the time you have kids, it'll be, you know, $167,000, right? Um it's okay for money to uh, play a role in this decision. Um, you know, it's not a bribe uh, to say something like that. So hopefully that helps. Great. So, uh, you know, these are the final two questions I ask um, all the guests on the podcast. Uh, and the first is, uh, you know, what, what, what one or two pieces of advice uh, would you give students about the college admissions search process in general? Sure. I mean, we've talked about a lot of them, but I, you know, I got in a lot of trouble when The Price You Pay for College came out um, because the excerpt in the New York Times had a headline that went something like, um, you know, your high school grades, uh, high school grades could be worth 100, it could be worth six figures in discounts. Uh, um, you should tell your eighth grader. Um, and, you know, adolescent psychologist Twitter like took a battering ram to me <laughs> like these kids have enough pressure on how can you do this to them right the grades equal money um, and uh, you know college counselors were like hey hey wait a second you jerk like we're trying not to start this process <laughs> until junior year and now all these like freshmen and their parents are going to show up asking you know questions about whether you know the difference in merit aid between an A and an A minus um, and there's going to be all these pre this pressure on the teachers now because if they like downgrade our sophomores, they're literally going to be costing families five figures as far as you're concerned. So, you know, thanks a lot. Um, <laughs> and I thought, you know what? Um, I have some, some sympathy for that. Um, but I didn't build this system and neither did you, right? But both of us have to live within it. It's not like, you know, King Palumbo can just like opt out of all of this and like yank his school along with them. This is a marketplace, right? It's a marketplace for teenagers. It's a marketplace that involves six figures of dollars. And you don't just turn around a marketplace like that in the space of years or even decades. You don't blow it to smithereens all within, within wealth, one fell swoop. So like, What's worse here, you know, starting early and telling kids the truth that they will eventually find out anyway on their own? Or do we try and keep it from them and don't explain merit aid and don't tell them um, about what we're able or willing to pay until three years of, of high school is already behind them? At that point, they'll be furious, right? How how could you not have trusted me with this essential information that mattered to my high school life? Did you think I couldn't handle it? Right? I mean, that to me is a worse outcome. So I don't like the system, right? But, you know, my job is to help people beat it. Uh, I, I can't, uh, you know, all by myself blow it, blow it up, even though I think a lot of us, including people who work within it, would like to blow it up. Yeah, I you know it's it's funny it is it is a a double edged sword. I mean, a, a goal of this podcast is to try to get more information out to families, especially those who who may not have the access to to this type of of uh, uh, guidance or or sort of insider information, if you will. Um, but the trouble with that is that um, you know I, I, my goal is not to ratchet that process up, but unfortunately, um, you know, it's not a it's not a perfect system. Yeah. So, uh, and and how about for for parents? What what piece of advice would you give parents? Well, you know, I think the other thing that um, you know the other thing that came out of of my research was that like. You know, as much as I, um, as much as I, um, you know, encourage people to have like a stronger sense of entitlement to more information, um, I'm not. 
being oppositional, like broadly or oppositional for being, for the sake of being oppositional. And I'm not cynical. Um, I came out of this research actually having a ton of hope, right? That was the one overarching um, piece of information that I walked away from because, you know, for better or for worse, um, you know, too many of my constituents, right? New York Times readers, uh, you know, in particular, uh, get all sort of worked up in their heads about, you know, private is better than public and Ivy is better than this and NESCAC versus blah, 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 right? And, you know, as I went out, you know, um, visiting institutions, many of which I'd never seen before, um, you know, that live somewhere along this continuum or trying to manage, you know, between the customer's mm -hmm. ability to pay and the customer's willingness to pay, there are all sorts of amazing schools out there that are ranked, you know, 79th but by whatever you know nameless uh, uh you know college ranking system and these places are spectacular right yeah. there's all sorts of amazing ways to find great friends and terrific mentors and and, and credentials that that mean something in a marketplace and so i i worry less um you know about my daughters um than i did five years ago that's hope absolutely well Ron, I want to thank you for joining us on the podcast. And uh, before we go, why don't you tell our listeners where they can find you and your work? Thank you. Um, so the price you pay for college is available um, anywhere and everywhere uh, books are sold, including your local independent bookseller. Please tell them I sent you. Um, you can find my work at the day job at nytimes.com slash Lieber. All of my columns and other stories are archived there. Um, and of course, I'm, you know, messing around on MChat, uh, enrollment management uh, 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 chat, <laughs> Twitter. Um, I'm at Ron Lieber on Twitter, at Ron Lieber on Instagram and on Facebook. I am facebook.com slash Ron Lieber author. And if you want to drop me a note, uh, ronlieber.com has a uh, contact form and I try to write back to everybody instantly. It doesn't always work, but I do my best. Well, thanks a lot, Ron. I really appreciate it. It was my pleasure. Thanks for having me on. I'm glad you're doing this. Enjoying the podcast? Like and subscribe to this YouTube video. You can also find us on the web at insideadmissionpodcast.com and you can find and engage with us on social media where our handle is Inside Admission on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook.